Hello, this is episode 7 of the Post-Concussion Syndrome Awareness Podcast. Uh, my name's David, and uh, today uh, I'm going to have a look at uh, some of the glossaries and terms of some of the neurological symptoms of post-concussion syndrome, uh, things which may fill in some gaps here and there, things you've experienced yourself but haven't had diagnosed or not even been able to put a name on, and then also I'll have a look at uh, different types of remedies, things that have helped myself and other people to recover, and these are collected from lists both on our groups and, and website as well. So there may be many alternatives than you find to the normal allopathic medicine, you know, pharmaceutical medicines from your doctor or, or uh, your clinician. Uh, now, first of all, uh, I want to just mention uh, a big thank you to our very own Gina Hubert. Uh, Gina and I have known each other for, I guess, about 10 years now. Gina lives down in New Zealand, and she's an absolutely w wonderful artist, a use of colour. Very, she does some very, very um, kind of lovely, kind of cerebral, abstract art, uh, and a lot of it based in nature as well. So she's provided very kindly from her uh, artwork co collection the images for our YouTube channel, uh, because a few of you had asked us uh, to put this out on YouTube as well. And apologies if I sound a little bit hoarse uh, today. Um, I started on the uh, GC Math Yogurt, on Thursday and had quite a um, what they call a Herxheimer reaction so uh, it's, a, it's a bit like uh, your body kind of spitting out all the toxins and it's left me with a <coughs> a bit of a cough, a bit of a, uh, a cold cold like symptoms that you get from a Herxheimer reaction. Uh, you can also get that with antibiotics and other things as well and Lyme disease and, uh, and different medications. Uh, so it's just basically your body trying to flush out uh, things from your, your gut and your microbiome. So yeah, if I'm a little bit croaky, just bear with me. I'll, I'll try and speak up as much as I can. And also, before I go any further, uh, I just wanted to uh, read out some more of your feedback, things as well, uh, from the last couple of episodes. Uh, I had a few people say they really enjoyed the interview uh, with Nid, and uh, she's uh, a fantastic lady, Nid, and she's kind of very, very willing to talk about her own experiences, uh, so there'll be more of that coming up later. And also uh, some questions and things on uh, the use of drugs and uh, the upcoming kind of use or development and research into uh, different things like ketamine and MDMA and so on. I had a, an email from one lady, um, I'll just say she's, she's from Kansas in the USA, and she talks about having seen a therapist, uh, like an underground therapist, and having really, really found tremendous use. Uh, this lady was in the US military um, for a few short years, and she'd come out um, as, as being, uh, being openly gay, lesbian, in the military, and shortly after, uh, I'd experienced a, a bit of a, a rough time from one or two superiors uh, and ended up being putting on uh, what she called the, uh, well, I'll, I'll just say the SHIT detail um, and uh, ended up uh, getting a, a concussion, ended up getting knocked out. Um, she didn't have a, I believe she said she didn't have a helmet to wear. And going home, uh, her and her partner struggled and then eventually broke up because of, uh, well, first the concussive issues and problems, but also uh, some, you know, stress, post-traumatic stress disorder as well. And she said uh, she'd had, I think, four, between four or six sessions or something with a therapist to remain unnamed, and obviously in a, a place that will remain unnamed. And um, she found really, really got her life back together. As for the post-concussion syndrome, drum symptoms, she said. Um, she li lives now in a state where cannabis oil is legal, Simpson oil. And um, she said that's helped mostly with the sleep and the mood and the pain, uh, because as we know, taking cannabis oil medicinally for medicinal reasons is not the same as smoking for recreational purposes, because the oil and the phytochemicals in it are absorbed in the body and into the brain, into the turpin receptors and the cannabinoid, endocannabinoid receptors in the brain. So it's different. Smoking only gives you a disassociation from pain, really, or re relaxation, apparent relaxation. So this lady was saying, well, you know, 
in the day and age that we live in, and you know, we're all coming from different backgrounds. She says, "Well, you you have to take a risk sometimes." And I mean, this is her opinion. It's not necessarily mine or ours, but she's saying, "If I hadn't have taken that." Uh, chance to find somebody, then they may still really be suffering and kind of, uh, you know, kind of fall to the eyeballs of, of uh, doctors' prescription drugs uh, at the moment. So thank you for um, letting us know your own personal story. It's very brave of you. Uh, another gentleman uh, is from um, Cambridgeshire. I'll just say Cambridgeshire in the UK, which is uh, south southeast. Uh, is talking about um, educating his own GP, his own doctor. Uh, So this is kind of what might happen in the UK in in a more upper middle class or or better area where you have kind of more funds and things. You're going to expect a better type of service from the NHS. Uh, So he's, he's currently trying to educate his GP and uh, his local authority service on ways to treat post-concussion syndrome without just resorting to the drugs and things and leaving people on long waiting lists, which um, is trying to impress on them, only compounds the problem all the way through. So good luck with that. Um, Now, coming to the glossaries for post-concussion syndrome, so, uh, you know, what the different things mean and how how you do they become part of the language of post-concussion syndrome. Some of these may only find <clears throat> from neurologists or in textbooks, things like that. Uh, but some of them you may well be familiar with them when I describe them, when I go through them as well. Well, here we've got, I'll go through a few first of all. There's acalculia, an ability to recognise numbers and do simple mathematical sums or to count. Uh, We've got uh, agitagraphia. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing these correctly, but that's the emission or distortion of letters, words, and parts of words. Agnosia, the loss of comprehension, sensory input, like sounds, sights, and also the ability to recognize familiar objects despite uh, the physical senses being intact. Agraphia, the inability to express thoughts in writing. Amnesia, we've already covered in uh, another episode. And then there's uh, anomia, inability to remember names of people and objects. Anosmia, loss of sense of smell. And then we look all uh, ataxia, that's another common one that comes up a lot. Uh, The ability to coordinate muscles, movement and action to the extent that it can affect your coordination, your walking, talking, eating and just, you know, other daily tasks as well. Um, Axons, that's an important one. Axons, axonal damage in the brain isn't usually seen, well, it's never seen in in MRI or PET scans, uh, uh, sorry, MRI or CT scans, but it can be seen in DTI scans, uh, detention imaging scans. Um, So... The axons is classed as a long cytoplasmic extensions of the nerve cells or neurons that conduct the electrical impulses and messages around both the central and peripheral nervous systems. And some of them can be that several feet in length. So it is axonal, when you hear about axonal shearing and shearing in the brain, where these interconnected like roadways between brain cells and nerve cells uh, have got kind of squashed or distended or, or inflamed or, or things and and that won't necessarily be picked up uh, I think like when I had a CT scan they said oh yeah you've got some brain swelling you know that's all but that's as much as they could tell you you know they can't go into any further detail there um, <clears throat> brain stem lower part of the brain just above the spinal cord it contains the uh, midbrain, pons, medulla oblongata, structures that control your be- breathing, heart rate, motion, sensations. Um, plasticity, brain plasticity, and the ability of the non-injured brain cells to take over the functions of the ones that have been damaged or distended. And neuroplasticity, of course, is a process of reforming those pathways and connections as well. 
Uh, what else have we got here? Central nervous system, CNS, which you're all familiar with. Um, the brain and spinal cord are, the, the, you know, obviously each end of that. And we've got uh, contusions. So injuries relating in localised bruising, swelling and hemorrhaging from capillaries. These are often ones that result in MTBI. Uh, corpus callosum, a band of nerve fibres that connects the left and right brain hemisphere, allowing them to communicate. So very often after following a, a maltraumatic brain injury, a person will be less able to conduct uh, simple tasks or logical tasks. And they may find that their sense of reason, logical reason and coordination, everything else just goes out the window a lot of the time. Um, you certainly may find that in the months and years that follow a brain injury, you're more creative, the right side of your brain, the more imaginative side, uh, artistic side, may well, as, as your brain heals, become slightly more predominant as well. So that that's uh, not uncommon. Um, coup contra coup, or blow, counter blow, types of head injuries which can impact on one side of the head can cause a brain literally bouncing back in onto the opposite side of the skull. So you could injure the you know front and back simultaneously. Uh, diffuse axonal injury, widespread injury to axons, part of the nerve cells in the brain. Nerve impulses lead nerve cells through a part of the nerve cell called the axon and diffuse axonal injury. Axons throughout the brain are damaged. It usually includes falls and motor vehicle crashes. And, uh, you know, as a result of this type of injury, brain cells may die or may cause brain swelling. An increased pressure within the skull. Increased pres pressure can then compound the injury by decreasing blood flow and supply to the brain. So that, that's uh, quite a common thing. Uh, it can show up on CT and MRI, uh, but again, it's treated with general measures, as in all types of uh, head injuries. Uh, there's not really any cause for uh, surgical interventions or anything. Dilopia, double vision, uh, disinhibition, loss of restraint, ability to stop oneself doing or saying things that are typically, typically inappropriate or socially undesirable. And that goes in with emotional dis uh, lability as well. And I think we've all had a fair share of that. And, and it's caused us a fair share of problems to people who have you know, got no idea what we're going through. But... Unfortunately, sometimes have been on the end of uh, all of that. Uh, Disfluency, stuttering, re repetition, repetition and drawing out of initial word sounds. Dysgraphia, partial inability to perform the motor movements required for writing. Dysnomia, the difficulty in finding, re re retrieving words to use. And then we've got uh, hemiparesis. Weakness on one side of the body due to injuries to motor areas of the brain. Uh, and if you've ever kind of woken up one morning with half your body asleep, they, you know that's quite scary as well. Hemiplegia, again the paralysis of one side of the body. Hypothalamus, part of the brain which induce, in, influences sleep, body temperature, sex drive, appetite, long-term memory and emotional expression. Enterical behaviour syndrome, a long-term dramatic personality difference exhibited by some seizure sufferers, characterised by depression, increased aggression, diminished sexuality, etc. And um, <clears throat> Related terms as well, there are uh, many years disease, which rarely affects people with brain injury. But it can happen, uh, and that's quite debilitating indeed, especially on top of PCS. Uh, it's a condition where like, you get like a one-sided low-frequency hearing loss, like a sensation of like the ear being full as well, ringing, buzzing, vertigo, uh, quite unpleasant indeed. Occipital lobe, the back part of the brain, is responsible for perception, interpretation of visual information, uh, parasphasia, speech problems characterised by substitution of parts or syllables of words for the actual words. Parietal lobe, the upper middle section of the brain, which is responsible for sensory and spatial awareness, giving feedback from 
and understanding of eye, hand and arm movements during complex operations such as writing, reading and numer numer numerical calculations. <clears throat> PET scans have to be mentioned here. Uh, it's a positron emission tomography scan. This is a scan that provides three dimensional pictures that can show chemical activity of the tissues being examined. So uh, not something we really have here in England. Uh, it's like um, the like DTI scanners as well, the, the types that you really, really need to be able to get to the bottom of uh, uh, MTBI neurological problems. Phonophobia, abnormal sensitivity to noise often experienced during migraine attacks. Photophobia, extreme sensitivity to light, often comes in, in tandem with migraines. Uh, PONS, a prominence of brain stem which is located between the medulla oblongata and the midbrain, mid which was mentioned earlier. Post-traumatic post amnesia, we've been through already, and post-traumatic seizures can happen. More and more people choosing to use CBD oil and Simpson oil in order to treat these instead of traditional medications. Uh, then we've got quadruparesis, a weakness in all four limbs as a result of brain injury. Somatoform disorder, the presence of one or more physical complaints for which an explanation cannot be found. So yeah, we do get all these catch-all categories and things as well, even in neurology where there's simply no explanation yet available by the physicians and neurologists and so on as well. Um, <clears throat> Syncope, medical term, you might have seen this on your documents, your medical records and things as well. Medical term for a fainting episode characterised by dizziness and sweating, followed by loss of con unconsciousness, consciousness. Uh, the temporal lobe, of course, part of the brain located from the front and parietal lobes, that plays a part in remembering information, noticing things, understanding music, categorising objects, the ability to smell and taste, um, the vernix area is at the back left of the temporal lobe and that's responsible for hearing and interpreting language. A thalamus, a part of the brain that acts as a nerve impulse relay station for information being sent to and from the brain, passing it to the hypothalamus to be screened and transmitted throughout the body. Um, tinnitus, condition of persistent evil, roaring, buzzing, ringing through the ears, that can be intermittent. Verbal apraxia, an impaired control of sequencing of muscles used in speech, specifically the tongue, lips, jaw muscles and vocal cords. And last but not least here, visual spatial agnosia, problems with understanding external environmental relationships. So yeah, there's quite a list there. And it all stems to things that um, you may kind of pushed down the list of symptoms, I guess. I guess I did for, for many years. I was more focused on the main symptoms like the pain, uh, the brain fog, uh, any anxiety, depression, the things that you know you're probably going to be able to cope with first. Um, but then the smaller things you don't always notice. So unless you've seen a speech therapist or an occupational therapist or a neuropsychologist or um, you know any number of... Ex specialists are really detailed in, in those areas, um, you're probably not going to have a full diagnosis of, of all the symptoms. And like we were seeing in the groups, there are around about 40-odd symptoms in the post-concussion syndrome. But I think, in, in fact, there can be many more in minor ways, um, especially given from the, the list we've just been through there as well. So the main way be more, many more terms that you find or interchangeable terms that you'll find used as well, uh, especially from neurologists. But that's just to give you an idea of some of the things which are, are quite common that you can look for. If you can identify something, at least that's a step towards becoming more aware of it, that it's happening for yourself. Or if you're listening to this as a care caregiver or a parent of somebody with PCS, then it's a way of identifying areas rather than not noticing or kind of pulling the person up on something that you, they, they can't really help. It can help you just to kind of be stand back and view things in a different light as well. Um, now, of course, yeah, on to 
alternative or what's usually classed as foodstuffs or methods and things to help the brain to boost and grow as you go through this process. Uh, so like I said to you, I started out with just literally all medications, painkillers, tranquilizers, sleeping tablets and so on. And I just got in, in, in a worse and worse and worse mess as, as the months and years went on without actually tackling any of the symptoms whatsoever. When I did get out of that, I started to look to think, well, actually, you know, the symptoms are still there to some extent, a lot, lot of the issues. What can I do to re kind of replace these things with, with natural things? So I would look around. I started out, first of all, as we do with the, the main symptoms and work the way down. Main symptoms. So you've got depression, mood, anxiety, brain fog, clarity, and so on as well. Um, I think most people have been put on SSRIs, uh, different types of antidepressants, which can kind of cover up the symptoms for so long. But once you come off them, the underlying causes, so that's situational depression, i.e. how bad your situation is, or you know the, the things that you've had to grieve or you've lost from your life, such as job, relationship, you know, family members, friends, money, kind of possessions, or you've had things you've had to give up. All those issues are still there once you come off them, usually. I've, I've yet to meet kind of many people who've just actually had a depression cured by antidepressants. You know, most of them are still taking them, some for like 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And if they came off them, they'd still be, you know, possibly very, very depressed uh, without actually having to tackle what's really going on underneath and doing any deep work on themselves. All right, that's not in every case, but in a lot of cases, yeah, you're suppressing that. Um, so it's, it's kind of deep in your soul anyway. Situationally, yeah, you can do things, you can rebuild your life, but the scars, the kind of scars on the inside will always be there. So what, what did I look through? Well, I looked through everything that I could find herbally and uh, different things. Uh, people mentioned St. John's Wort, Ashkawanda, all kinds of stuff. But um, from those, one that I found was extremely useful and not just any old brand was 5-hydroxytryptophan uh, or 5-HTP. Now, there are a lot of different makes out there. Um, the tablet form seems to work better than capsules for some reason. And there are kind of more expensive, more sophisticated blends with magnesium, vitamin C, B vitamins, folic acid, uh, and so on. And some of those can be good. Um, you will have to maybe try a few. Don't just get a generic one that's kind of, you know, from a random supplier. Try and find the, 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 like the double strength ones or the, the tablet form. And those will give you uh, uh, an idea of how, if you can tolerate that, because certain people will tolerate things differently. And sometimes it can be a case that um, things like 5-HTP can initially overstimulate the brain a bit. And so you have to be careful, rather than throwing the baby out with the bathwater, as they say, that if you know take something for a day or two or three and you find that you're, you're a bit o overworked with it, then maybe just reduce that dose a little bit and just take it down and hydrate properly rather than just throwing it out and going, oh, no, that didn't work for me. It made me feel terrible because um, it seems to be a common theme that people will, will try something for a short time and they don't f feel that it works rather than adjusting the dose or adjusting the lifestyle of the diet uh, as well. They'll just kind of go, no, so I'll, I'll, I'll put that on the pile of things that just don't work. Now, you can also find uh, many things in tincture form. This is something that people often overlook. Uh, now, with tinctures, uh, you can have maybe St. John's wort or different types of things as a tincture. If you're not able to tolerate the tablet form, which some people aren't, it can be easier to take little bits uh, in liquid form. Now, thinking about that as well, there's, there's oil form, like CoQ10, which is very good for energy and memory and day-to-day uh, yeah, -day heart function as well. So that, that can actually help to boost mood and elevate mood too. Uh, one thing that I found that was very good 
with that was some of the uh, Ayurvedic medicines, such as Brahmi or Bacopi Monieri, which is a, a Bacopi Monieri is a, a herbal, it's like a collection of, of different marine plants, I think 30 odd or something marine plants, and that's very good for mood and elevating uh, mood and relieving anxiety and just kind of making you generally more chilled out. Um, like Himalaya brand, I think it's the Indian one. They call it Brahmi, but that's Bacopi Monieri. There's also um, many different uh, types of tinctures that are going to be helpful, as well as essential oils too. So with specific symptoms, like if you are on medications unavoidably, then uh, there's one that's called uh, come the Barberry tree, Barberry bush, sorry which is uh, like a, a bush that carries little red berries, which is called the golden healer, which is very good for stomach and digestive issues. So that if you are on medications and they are kind of you know, hurting your stomach lining sometimes, then this is very good um, all round for digestion, like for relieving uh, issues that can be medication related. So that, that's a very good one to, to look up to. Now, uh, oils that can cross a brain barrier. So we think about Omega-369 oils and then also any containing EPA, DHA, which are substances which will cross over the blood-brain barrier and into the brain in order to help that neuroplasticity to reduce inflammation and to help your brain heal a lot quicker. And you'll, you'll probably find if you start taking these regularly, you'll feel more alert, your memory will be boosted and improved as well. Um, now, it's, it's a common misconception that omega oils just kind of come from fish. Well, actually where the fish get it from is they eat the algae and the things in the water. And it's actually the algae where the, the omega comes from. Uh, so you can now actually get vegan omega or vegetarian vegan omega oils, which is actually a good thing because not everybody wants to eat fish oil encased in a gelatin capsule made from, you know, kind of cow bones or gelatin. So it may be easier sometimes if, if you're a bit intolerant to certain things like gelatin, it may be easier for you to consider that as well. Not only that, but Amiga helps heart health, immunity, helps to prevent cancer and, and boosts you, you know, kind of joints and muscles as well. As well, we'd also be looking at a, a few different uh, things for pain. I've already mentioned before, uh, curcumin, Novosol curcumin oil, which is the active alkaloid from turmeric. Now, fresh turmeric is great, or turmeric in your, your curry or, or your dish, you know, your, your cooked food dishes is great. A tablet form is okay, but you're only getting a small amount of that, even if you put piperine, black pepper in it, and people mix it into pastes and all kind of things. But if you really want a supercharged version, then the Novosol curcumin oil capsules are way, way, way ahead of the game. There are more bioavailable versions, like liposomal curcumin as well, um, and some of them are, are, are less absorbent or more absorbent, depending on how much you pay for them. You know, some of the more expensive ones will be like two or three times the price, or at least, or maybe even five or six times the price of the Novosol curcumin. And, uh, you know, it's kind of debated whether it's worth paying that, but I guess if you can afford it. Uh, so what does that curcumin do? It uh, reduces inflammation, most importantly. In the body, in the nervous system, it will kill pain, joints, and muscles, um, helps the heart, again provides immunity and protection from cancer, cancers as well. So it, that's classed as flavonoid, it's reversatrol as well, which is another kind of fruit vegetable source flavonoid. And there's many others as well. If you look up flavonoids, you'll find a whole long list of those as well uh, that are in daily kind of food things and fresh foods that you'll find uh, here, there and everywhere. Now you may find as well, particularly with uh, some of the men, that uh, you might find great benefit from certain types of uh, amino acid supplements. Personally, having fibromyalgia, then L-arginine is one of the just like absolute miracles. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. You can, you can take a, a fair bit every day and it really does give you an energy boost, relieve pain and discomfort. But it also helps you uh, in ways which are very important to gentlemen as well. 
and it will help your vitality and you kind of like your vigor as well. Uh, creatine as well, another one. But there are a few others, but creatine is very good for producing energy uh, and energy throughout the day. A lot of uh, kind of bodybuilders, weightlifters, and people that work out use that too. Um, but obviously, they have the benefits for, for, for ladies as well. Now, on to external pain and bruising, uh, and, and the, the sensation and the feeling of bruising as well. And of course, anything that I kind of say to you, anything that I recommend, or anything that recommend you look up, is only there, is only my opinion. So, of course, you must take all the normal steps and precautions, do your research, ask around, ask people, do your googling, you know, look up in books if you, if you still read books, and check for yourself any contraindications. If you are worried then obviously speak to a, a nutritionist or speak to a doctor uh, in case you may be taking any other medications or things that might counteract. But generally most of the things that I'd recommend are classed as foodstuffs. Uh, but you may sometimes get contraindications, so always double check as well. Um, and as well, oils, one of the main things topically, uh, particularly with uh, types of bruising. I've already mentioned capybara oil, which is exceptionally good, very, very, very high in beta carfilines, more so than cannabis oil. It can be applied on the skin, uh, and it's antibacterial as well. It heals the skin, burns, cuts and bruises. But most of all, it reduces bruising or the sensation of bruising as well. So you may sometimes feel from an old injury that, you know, you kind of you get a sensitive area. And if it's months or even years after, it might still come up and you think, oh, that still feels bruised. So it's something you can rub onto the back of your neck, the base of your skull or even onto your head as well. Always test a tiny bit uh, in advance. And it's one that's kind of good to have around the home as a general uh, anti-inflammatory, but also one that you could have in your kind of own self-care kit for just things that you should have anyway, um, because it's so so flexible. Um, you can even use it, uh, you can gargle with it, like if you, for three or four drops of copaiba with some honey and warm water, a bit of lemon juice. If you've got a sore throat or a tonsillitis or anything like that, and that will really help to get to work on any, any bacteria, any bad bacteria. Other things as well, um, in terms of oils, rosemary oil is mentioned a lot as a, a, a cephalic or neurostimulant, which is good for concentration. Uh, there's also calamus oil as well, which is particularly good for the nervous system. And as a cephalic, helps uh, concentration as well. Uh, it's also an antibiotic too. Uh, it smells absolutely wonderful as well. It's good stuff. And it can also be used as a stimulant, uh, a natural nervous brain stimulant, and also as a tranquilizer as well to help you to relax and calm down too. Other oils that we use, uh, we'll mention guac wood before, which is uh, an ingredient, uh, part of the tree that used to make guafenicin. Uh, guafenicin tablets can be used as a, a protocol for fibromyalgia to help reduce inflammation and mucus in the chest and so on. Other oils uh, that you're going to find useful as well. And yeah, I could probably go all, all night here, most of the night here, because this is one of my um, kind of fa favourite areas of geekishness. Um, as well, you've got turmeric essential oil. So not something to be taken internally. This is different to the curcumin oil. Uh, that's very good. I mean, like you can put a few drops in your bath after you've run your bath. Uh, that to reduce inflammation and tenderness. Uh, also cypress oil uh, or blue cypress very very good for pain as is geranium oil wintergreen sweet birch uh, niuli um, palo santo which is high in limonene and uh, quite a few others as well uh, all very good which you can maybe mix a few together with some some carrier oil and use to, to kind of rub on painful areas um, other ones we've got uh, Amaris, very good for lifting mood and, and feelings of kind of uh, either depression or of kind of hopelessness as well. Um, sandalwood, very good for um, kind of enhancing, bringing up chi, the male energies, rebalancing. A lot of women find that extremely powerful as well and really good. Um, and then we've got a few others as well, which, which are just simply really, really good in different areas. Uh, one particularly from South America, uh, where a lot of my favourites come from, we've got Cabruava, 
which comes mainly from Chile. And that one is really something that has uh, kind of perplexed the pharmaceutical industry for decades because they know it can kill cancer cells and cancerous cells kind of stone dead. But they can't find a way to synthesize it. It, it, it literally won't. It refuses to be uh, altered so they can patent it. But it's an unknown fact that it's really got a high level rate of killing the uh, cancerous cells. Frankincense as well, a, a wonderful all-round healer. There's three or four different types of frankincense tree. Uh, but again, that's a, a good all-round healer and, and good for cancer prevention too. Um, <clears throat> What else have we got in here? Uh, let me just see what's in the box. Um, we've got... Uh, let me just find it. Ah, right, yeah. Juniper oil. Cade. Uh, which are two... Uh, oh, the Cade has to be rectified. Uh, but those are two which are, are very kind of uplifting for mood. Uh, they're very good for kind of protecting yourself in, in, um, in a spiritual sense and, a, and a, a, an energetic sense of going into difficult situations because the two are, are very very protective um, and you know you, you'll you'll feel comforted by it as well um, so there are lots of different ones uh, if you do if you do want to contact me directly if, if you're not local like to the UK um, obviously I can give you uh, some of my recipes or so, some of the details of, of what I use in blends and you can make you make your own I can send you instructions and so on if not just find make sure you find a you know fully trained qualified uh, aromatherapist or somebody that sells and deals with essential oils near where you live and they should probably have a few blends that you could try as well um, so different things that they would use yeah definitely uh, I'd use capybara a lot because it magnifies other oils so it can make them stronger and enhance them to be more effective um, just the other day yeah, ha having a reaction I mixed together some capybara cacai oil as a carrier oil some toma seed oil which is particularly good for fibromyalgia and fibrosis and then some calamus oil and a bit of cabra waver so the idea there is to just cut create a nice balance of, of like restoring both comfort to the body through like a difficult reaction or a difficult time uh, and then also protecting it with a cabra waiver uh, and then reducing inflammation as well so like a, a kind of attacking it on all angles really and that's something that aromatherapy and a, a use of essential oils does allow you to do very well once you know what the different oils can do and again, it's I'm nothing special, it's just a case of looking and studying and researching and seeing, well, what does this do? What are the benefits? What are the things it's not good for? Who can I use it for? How can I use it? So, yeah, pe feel free to get in touch with me uh, and message me if you do want more information on oils because uh, I'm finding more and more they can make such a vast difference rather than taking uh, antihistamines or things, the tablets, uh, all the time. Uh, you could mix up some lavender oil and carrier oil. Lavender's nature's great antihistamine. And uh, the more stressed you get, you can suffer with histamine problems. Or antihistamines, if you, if you get those and it's causing you headaches, your PCS as well, if you've got allergies and things. Uh, nature's other cures are vitamin C. Then you've got uh, bromelain, which is an enzyme that comes from pineapples, and quercetin. So those three together, vitamin C, bromelain, quercetin, uh, are pro possibly the most powerful natural antihistamine I've ever come across. That and the lavender oil. Kashmiri lavender is particularly lush and beautiful. You know, it's that, that's just my own personal favourite. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've had antihistamines before, uh, but those three... Um, are really really powerful together. Uh, so what else haven't I mentioned? Uh, we talked about digestion, barbary, uh, tincture as well. Um, yeah, if you are on medications as well, you know you know me uh, by now. If you've listened to a few episodes, I don't mince words. I don't kind of like just uh, dress things up to to make them sound fancy. Yeah, if you have medications and you can't go, so yeah, you know how that is, so particularly with painkillers. If you're on codeine or dihydrocodeine and you're there like, oh, I really want to go, but I can't go. 
um, you've got, well, one of the main things you get is some psyllum husks. Uh, now, I'm lucky where I live. We've got lots of uh, Arabian and Indian and Asian markets. I can get a little box for about a pound that will last weeks. Uh, but the psyllum husk comes from a, like a, a shell of a bean. You simply stir a tablespoon into some water or juice uh, and then you drink it down. So it's like added fibre into your diet. So depending on what your diet's like, or even if you just constipated through medications, that could be really powerful as well. If you really, really need to, to kind of force the issue, so to speak, then get hold of some magnesium citrate and you'll be guaranteed to go the next day, I promise you. Uh, but usually we wouldn't recommend magnesium citrate uh, for, for most people, unless that is the case where you really need to go. Which leads me nicely on to magnesium. Now, magnesium is the sleep mineral. It's vastly underrated, I think. And uh, even as far back as we know, in Egyptian times, they would eat so many dark green vegetables full of magnesium. And there's literally no incidences of cancer, hardly any, in their society at all. You know, they just hardly didn't even get it. They were so used to eating that. Um, so not just that, cancer preventative, but good boosts brain function, immunity as well, particularly immune response and cell response. And um, yeah, it uh, reduces inflammation. Also, uh, those green, dark green vegetables are very alkali. I mentioned alkali, acid balance before. If your body's too acidic, you're going to get inflamed. You're not going to recover. Your body's not going to repair itself as fast. So magnesium is essential for that. And it is also known as the sleep mineral. Regular daily intake, good intake of magnesium will help induce lower stages. That's stage four sleep. That's deep sleep. Um, the upper two are kind of like REM sleep and dreaming sleep. And then in between that to, to deep sleep, stage four is like deep dreamless sleep where the body repairs itself. So magnesium is essential as well. <clears throat> Now, um, going back to alkaline, an, an alkaline body, uh, with today's diets, that's quite hard to really have like a, an 80%, 20% alkaline acid balance. You might only be able to manage 60-40 or something like that. Um, but generally, alkaline foods are all the stuff that you're not particularly going to enjoy as much as the acidic foods. So you'd like spinach, alfalfa, dark greens, things like that. And then you, obviously your acidic foods, is anything, you know, like pizza, <laughs> ice cream, anything sugary, all the processed stuff, all, all the things that you're going to find that you really, really enjoy or, like, you know, you, your brain is kind of trained to enjoy. So eating an alkaline diet can be really important. Now you can get an alkaline water filter, um, literally for, you know, like 10, 15 pounds or, you know, $20 which is a water filter jug, but it's got a special alkaline uh, filter in it, which filters out a lot of the chlorine and taste and things that a normal water filter jug does, but it also um, kind of takes a pH level to alkaline uh, pH 9. Most tap water here in the UK is about pH 7 or thereabouts, which is kind of slightly acidic uh, to, to fairly acidic. And I'm sure like in the, in the States and other places that could be even higher. And I guess some of you have fluoride and things as well. So, yeah, looking to reduce the harm or damage. If you, if you do filter tap water, then drinking alkaline water can truly help as well, massively. And next, uh, methylcobalamin B12. Uh, like me, I didn't eat meat for many years. Only just a little bit of fish sometimes or vegetables, uh, a vegetarian diet. So B12 may be lacking in your diet, particularly after a brain injury. So possibly most more so if you're vegan or vegetarian or don't eat a lot of red meat and so on. Um, so the methylcobalamin B12 is important to state because certain B vitamins can be uh, kind of, you can get a bit of toxicity if you take too much of some of them. But the B12, the methylcobalamin, your body will only take as much as it needs. Now, Ironically, the rest you'll 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 just turn your your pea green basically, and you'll just your body will just flush it out. So that if you have a few hours after having it, you'll just go to the toilet and you'll be kind of like passing green water. So you'll know that it's coming out of your system. Um, 
You can get them in dissolvable, dissolvable form, like lemon or strawberry, or even tablet form as well. But that's going to be really good for reducing brain fatigue and bodily fatigue as well. Uh, which leads me on to iron. Again, iron will come from your dark green vegetables, leafy greens and so on, and uh, green vegetables. Um, but again, you know, sometimes you do need the extra boost. And I do get, when I talk about this in public or when I go to groups to talk about PCS, you always get one really healthy person that goes, uh, you know, like, kind of like, oh, well, if, if you just ate a healthy diet, you know, you wouldn't have to take all these supplements. And, you know, I always ask the person and, and it turns out, you know, they're obviously like at the gym every day or the, they've never really been ill or chronically ill, never had a brain injury or anything kind of go really badly wrong in the life. So they're saying for, yeah, for me, that's okay to do so. Uh, but I bet if you if you swap shoes with them and they could spend, you know, a week or a day or a month in your shoes and vice versa, then they would very, very quickly change a tune. Um, and unless you've got, you know, kind of like a personal chef on hand who's you know, a highly trained nutritionist and is there to kind of uh, be at your beck and call three or four times a day, then you're not really always going to be able to have that. So, you know, you might want to just take that with a pinch of salt when you hear somebody say that because, they, I mean, bless them, they don't really know because they've not walked a mile in your shoes. Uh, but iron, iron, truly important again to aid fatigue. Uh, and any of these uh, obviously can be aided by adding vitamin C, vitamin D3 uh, to aid absorption. Absorption rates really go up when you, when you add those uh, alongside uh, so you can feel more benefit from them. And your vitamin C is just, just wonderful anyway, as we all know about vitamin C. It's, it's such fantastic stuff. Um, I mean, like in its fluid and drip form, you could literally bring people back from the dead with it. You can literally cure just about almost any illness if you use enough intravenous vitamin C. But you won't see that in hospitals and wards. It won't, even the nurses and the doctors, they won't do that. They've not been taught to do it. It's not their fault. They're doing a great job. But, you know, there has been situations and I've seen people just literally be almost brought back to life with it, uh, intravenous vitamin C. So in the right form, you know, that fluid form, it, it can perform miracles. Uh, what else have we got on that list? So yeah, vitamin D3, vitamin D as well, important in the you know, energy process, the immune system particularly. And there's one thing that's going to be under attack when you are down with PCS and other chronic illnesses, that's your immune system. So daily doses, uh, you can get it a lot in, you know, kind of like chestnut mushrooms and different mushrooms, things like that. Various different fresh foods. So yes, those are always going to be good, but you may well find that kind of topping up with uh, like liquid D, vitamin D in, in capsules, it'll be really, really beneficial for you. And what else do we have? So you're going to find that there's a range of different vitamins and minerals out there that different people will take uh, for different benefits. Now we're seeing a designer market come forward, especially in the UK, where you're getting companies kind of like printing like five or six vitamins, minerals or medicines all into one tablet and charging an absolute arm and a leg mostly, uh, kind of claiming that they're, they're, they're like the, the next best thing. But I'm, I'm not too convinced about it yet. I think if you can afford like 50 or 60 pounds a month, uh, or, or you know kind of like 70 80 dollars a month or whatever then good luck to you if you've got that money you do it but for the rest of us you may just to kind of wait till the uh, the price comes down or there's a bit more competition as well so um final thing i want to discuss now and this is by no means again a, a complete exhaustive list is your cbd oil now here's an area which has been you've seen everybody and their dog has jumped on the bandwagon with cbd oil uh, I think it became av available back here in the UK in about 2013, 2000, early 2014, I believe. <clears throat> when I started using it, it was like, oh, right, I've, no, nobody's talking about this. I'll, I'll have some of this um, because I'd already read studies on uh, Simpson oil and cannabis oil elsewhere. And I knew that, well, you know, they could filter out like 99.8% of the THC so that, you know, it wasn't psychoactive. So I've been using those for a while, and like I said, I couldn't afford them after a while. Now, the prices may have come down slightly, but it seems that anybody that is anybody in the health industry is, is trying to flog your CBD oil. 
And as we see online and we see on Facebook, they're all there kind of raving about it in the videos and and, and going on about, you know, how, how wonderful, how they're going to save the world with it. But it's really nature's medicine, you know. It's not just because you've bottled it and put a label on it and you, you're selling it. It doesn't mean that you're, you know, you're bringing the cure to people. This stuff's been around for thousands, centuries, thousands of years probably. It's been around a long, long time in herbal medicine, healing medicine. Now, it was made illegal, obviously back in the 20s, the disputes with the farmers, they didn't want hemp crop, crops growing and things, and so, you know, the, the ban of cannabis uh, occurred in most places. Now, it's kind of coming back full circle, and the demand from people is so high, uh, particularly people where the children are ill, or have epilepsy, or grand mal seizures, all kind of stuff that, that really, really can't be treated well with drugs. Then they're able to use, you know, CBD oil or, ca or cannabis oil, Simpson oil, in order to get better, you know, kind of with within hours rather than kind of like days or weeks in hospital. So the CBD oil is still quite tough to work out what you're actually getting for your money because uh, the comparisons can be quite difficult. Now, you've got the male hemp plant, which is obviously not one that carries THC, really. And then the female plant, which is a flowering plant, which carries a THC. So what you'll find is that most people are extracting CBD resin from the male hemp plants. Now the CBD comes as a resin, which is then mixed into an oil like olive oil, sunflower oil generally, uh, and so on. Uh, and kind of like, uh, you know, emulsified and, and blended down into that. So uh, you've got all these new kind of words and buzz phrases that come out like um, full spectrum which actually means a bit like therapeutic grade it means absolutely naff all really it doesn't really mean anything um, I asked one guy you know what do you mean by full spectrum uh, you know and his CBD oil had, he's claiming had no THC in it at all he said oh we we'll use the whole plant the entire plant I said well do you use male plants or female plants he's like oh, 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 I don't know and he said well but there's no THC in it how can you claim it's full spectrum you know, if you you don't know what plant you're using and you've not if you've taken all the THC out, it's like well, well, you know, it is full spectrum. So you'll hear all these phrases and things, and they're they're just marketing a lot of them marketing ploys to kind of get your attention and, and make their brand seem like it's better than the other. What you need to pay, pay specific attention to is ask first of all, is this from a female plant? So there may be certain brands uh, that will grow in Holland and places where it's still legal to, or in certain parts of America, where they will produce from female plants where the phytochemicals are richer, and those will be ones to look at first, in my opinion. Uh, then you look at how many milligrams of resin there is in each oil. So like I said, what you're getting is usually olive oil or, or sunflower oil or something, you know, a different type of oil uh, that it's dissolved in. Uh, which is kind of like a carrier oil, is an essential oils, you know, and then the uh, uh, it, it, it delivers it. So you take it, the dose beneath your tongue, sublingually, and then it gets to work into your brain. So it can be a bit of a tough call to work out, you know, kind of like you have to get the calculator out sometimes. If there's so many milligrams in a, such a size bottle, and such a size bottle, you have to actually work out which has got the greater CBD content. And then when you do that, there's no kind of calculator online for it that I know about. Once you've done that, you realise, well, hang on, there's massive price differences. Oh, you know, how, how do you know who you can trust? So look for recommendations, but also look for the ones that you, if you can work out the higher content, the better content, and from female plants as well. And that's what I learnt from like three or four years of buying CBD oil uh, until I couldn't afford it anymore. Uh, otherwise, you'll just end up buying ones, and some will have an effect, other ones won't do as well. And stay away from the salesmen, stay away from the blarney and the, and the videos and the kind of things. Do your own research. Don't be swayed by somebody's kind of like life stories about how fantastic they are because they saved somebody with their brand of CBD oil. It's probably a lot of blarney, to be fair. Look at the hard facts and go from there. If you are somewhere where you're lucky enough to be able to get cannabis oil and to deal with like sleep issues and things, then, then good luck to you. Um, but that's possibly something for the future for the rest of us. So anyway, I'll finish rambling there. I hope you found that useful. Um, again, please contact me on uh, Twitter at Post Concussion. There's a handle there. 
find me on Facebook, uh, at face, uh, Facebook group, which are the groups we have, which is Post Concussion Syndrome Awareness Worldwide. Uh, you can contact me directly, as I'm one of the admins, obviously, David Bottomley. And you can find us on WordPress or the blog site, uh, which is uh, Post Concussion Syndrome Awareness UK WordPress com. And um, yeah, if you haven't listened to any of our other podcasts yet, uh, they do range quite a bit on subject and variety, and you you kind of find the same open, honest approach with all of them. Uh, I don't really care what anybody thinks, uh, apart from you, the people that have actually got post concussion syndrome, or the ones that you know kind of want to learn more. Uh, some people will will try and kind of just kind of message to criticise or so you know say you're not very professional or you know you're not a radio percent of whatever. Oh, I'm not. <laughs> I put my, the first to put my hands up. I'm just a, a normal person, just kind of trying to pass on what I've learnt over the last 10, 10, 12, 13 years, or however long it's been. So don't worry yourselves. Thank you for your criticisms. They're every bit as valuable as any compliments that I get. And blessings to you. All right, so until next time, thanks so much for listening. And uh, if again, get in touch if you have any questions at all. Or if you want to ask about essential oils and blends, I'll be more than happy to give you my time. Thank you so much and uh, a, lot, a lot of healing and blessings to you all. Cheerio.